the average public anyways, I don't think probably understands what this means for like thousands and thousands of poker players, you know? This was my livelihood and it wasn't just a game, you know? Like, it seems like it's just a bad dream that I wanna wake up from. There's just a lot of people in a panic. There's some people on the poker forums and stuff who are like 95% of their net worth like wrapped up in these online sites. And right now it's in limbo. Like we're all hoping that we're gonna get our money back and we'd like to be optimistic, but really we don't know, you know? I found out sitting around on a computer playing cards for a living was something you could actually do. I was like, that's it. That's that's what I'm gonna do with my life. It's a very like interesting game when you think about it. Like, what would you do to prevent me from winning all your money? I never in a million years would have ever expected to grow up and be a professional online poker player. I would have said it was more likely that I would grow up to be an astronaut. I think poker teaches you to evaluate on the fly. It's always up in the air. You can't say for sure it's ephemeral and you can't grasp it. You're almost outside yourself a bit in a good way when you're just making these complex decisions within the structure of this game. You're head to head with your opponent and it's whose mental brain power is gonna like outwit the other one. You're kind of like trying to get into their head and read their mind. And the better you can do that, the, the better at it you're gonna be. You try and make the best decision you can and leave everything else up to fate or destiny or whatever you wanna call it. And so every day has a little bit of mystery going into it. I play poker because I love poker, because I'm good at poker. I worked my way up through like the bottom and I'm really proud of where I like have ended up. Poker has definitely given me the opportunity to live life outside of the conventional system. It's given me the opportunity to, to allow myself to be happy. Everything that I have in my life is the result of my first $75 deposit in an online poker site. Poker is not just a game, it's so like, wrapped up in every other aspect of my life that it, it's like kind of become a part of my identity. Poker is one of the three really quintessentially American games. It came over here probably in the 1810s as a French game poker, but really became Americanized and really came to define how Americans gamble. Poker is a game that really embodies what this culture is all about. Everyone starts with the background that they've had, the experiences they've had, the knowledge they've had, the skills they have, and they sit down and play a game. America is all about the independent spirit. Just listen to any politician. All they want to talk about is freedom, you know, and individual liberty and choices. Well, that's what poker gives you. There is some luck, but by and large, those who have the most skill, the most knowledge, the most experience in some cases, are the ones who are going to go the furthest and win the most. That's the way it is in poker, and that's the way it is in life. A lot of people thought that people wouldn't be willing to play poker online because players had no way of knowing whether there was collusion going on or whether any of it was real, you know, and they said, well, why would people do that? The big question with a lot of online operators and, uh, and certainly those of us in industry were, would this thing last? Is this something that's gonna be around five, 10 years from now? And if it's around, how big will it be? Certainly Chris Moneymaker in 2003 changes everything. Everybody's dream is to win the big tournament. It's just the pinnacle of poker, and there can only be one a year. Helmut wins the championship. This is the tournament that everybody waits an entire year for. We did it, man! During the 1980s, the tournament actually had very flat numbers. It didn't grow. The 2003 World Series of Poker main event, that's the breaking point. The list of entrants, 839 players long, the most ever here at Binion's, and they have actually had to employ a downstairs poker room to hold the overflow. They had tables that were actually half inside Binion's and half outside on Fremont Street. There was just so many people there, and it was like, oh my, where did everyone come from? 
This huge increase of players was primarily a result of the explosion of online satellites. One more man I have to mention before we get underway at our featured table. His name is Chris Moneymaker. He won his way into this tournament by winning a $40 entry fee internet tournament. He was an amateur. He was an accountant by trade and played poker recreationally. Just a regular guy, an accountant for a restaurant chain here with the big boys. That was the appeal for spectators at home because we could relate to a guy like Chris Moneymaker. Chris Moneymaker knocks another big player out of the tournament. He's the guy that you work with. He's your next door neighbor. He's your cousin. He's your brother. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. You ready to have some fun? You ready to have some fun? The Chris Moneymaker Sam Farha matchup is your classic David vs. Goliath. You have your underdog, Chris Moneymaker taking on the proverbial Las Vegas Shark. Sammy has the edge, he's a high action experienced player, and let's face it, this kid is playing for a big prize for the first time in his life. It's a lot of money, a lot of pressure. That's why you hear in sports, when you go to the championship game, the first time you get there, you usually don't win. Okay, I'll go all in, let's go. I call. Sam Farhawk goes all in, and Chris Moneymaker's gonna call it. And with two pair, Chris Moneymaker, a statistical improbability to win this title at the outset, is now closing in on making it an incredible reality. With a full house, Chris Moneymaker eliminates Sam Farhawk, and the 27-year-old has stepped out of the virtual poker room, and in a very swift and unlikely manner, is atop the poker world. When people saw that, it became somewhat of an American dream, where, wow, the guy's name is Moneymaker. He just turned 40 bucks into two and a half million dollars. I want that to be me. Suddenly, everybody in the country, whether they live close to a casino or not, said, hey, I didn't even know poker was available online. All of these elements came together to make the perfect storm, and online poker just exploded. That was the thing in the past. If you weren't from, like, Vegas, LA, Atlantic City, a couple other spots, you basically couldn't be a great poker player. And that's really the reason that online poker has done so much, because it made it possible for anyone anywhere to become potentially the greatest poker player in the world. That's the moneymaker effect. about 13,000 people in southern Minnesota. It's a pretty traditional, conservative town. It is definitely not common to be a professional poker player in New Ulm. As far as I know, I'm the only one. I discovered poker through my husband, Corey. Him and his buddies were always playing in college. And at first I like didn't want to learn at all because I don't like learning new games. But um, eventually I joined in and I just kind of had like a natural talent for the game and I just started winning all the time. She just got good at it. It was pretty quick that she was certainly elevated to the top of our friendly little game that wasn't very competitive. But I thought it was just one of these fad things, you know, kids go through. And, but at that time that she was still in college. And then all of a sudden, I find after the fact that, well, she took a few semesters off to gamble. I specifically remember Corey and I having a conversation and we were like really excited because we were thinking that like, it was maybe a possibility that I could make a hundred extra dollars a month. And we were just talking about like, what an impact that would have on our life. I was really surprised when she got her laptop out here one day and she was playing and she had like four different games going at the same well, time, you know, and that, and then, it, then I think I realized that, she's wow, serious. she's got something going on here. I never in a million years imagined that it would like continue to go and progress to where it has now. So are those grapes? Yeah, and, that, and that's a blueberry. Oh, and this must be a banana? 
And that's an apple. What's the green thing? Uh, that's a spoon. Oh. <laughs> Poker allows me freedom that other people just don't have through their jobs. I have friends who are tied down to like nine to five jobs and they, they have to miss events in their life that would be important to them because they have a, a job that requires them to be there. And poker allows me to be my own boss, really. I don't have to miss any of life's big events. I, I've thus far been very, very blessed and I've, I've been able to be there for all of them. And that's something that just holds a ton of value to me. You think that's Apple The job? freedom that poker allows me yeah. to have is just priceless. Nice catch, on huh, Dad? Oh, you're gonna eat it. <laughs> ah. I've always pretty much had some game that I'm playing. Before I started playing poker, my, my main obsession was StarCraft. StarCraft is really, really fun. I'm from Australia, so I remember waking up at like four in the morning and play US players uh, on dial-up, which was pretty pretty frustrating because everyone had a broadband. But uh, I, I noticed in the StarCraft community there was there was kind of a lot of chatter about online poker and a lot of the, the better players at StarCraft were kind of fooling around, or it seemed like they were fooling around with poker. Uh, someone like Intelliman or like uh, Elki, yeah, they, they were kind of playing the highest games on PokerStars, which seemed ridiculous because they had kind of just jumped into this with a year of experience. So, so that kind of led me to initially playing poker. At first, it felt kind of boring and slow. You know, you get dealt hands. It's not like a real-time strategy game where you're like... <laughs> but once, once those kind of aesthetics fade away and you start dealing with the human element, then, then the kind of richness of the game becomes apparent. It's a kind of tricky process learning something that you really have no idea about with no kind of support group helping you learn. Uh, you're just kind of like swimming into the tide hoping that you'll get to some island eventually and just kind of having the faith that you will. So in my second year of university, poker started to take over and at some point something had to give. One day I guess I just woke up and it was, was the university. By the time I got to Germany, I remember distinctly sending my brother an email saying like, you know, I'm through taking this as kind of like a middle range thing, like I want to play the biggest games all day, every day, and for the next couple years, pretty much all my ambitions were related to success at poker and everything kind of, well, everything else fell to the sidelines and became less important. I never mind bringing the jacket in just a okay. dash in the back to make it give it sort of more of that yeah, V-shape. Yeah, we, we definitely have to clean up the mm -hmm. back a little. We're gonna race collar here and we're gonna take it in just a tad, just to give you more of a silhouette. Are you rotating in the back? Sure. Okay. Throughout high school, I was definitely attracted to the Bond or GQ lifestyle that I had seen in so many magazines and movies. And I wanted to grow up and, and live that lifestyle to be able to travel the world, you know, be dressed to the nines at all time, be able to pick up girls with ease, um, have a bunch of really cool friends who would connect me to stuff going on, you know, in whatever city I was visiting. So that was always kind of, that was the dream for me. Instead of owning a bunch of things, it was having a bunch of experiences. This is amazing, man. With the brown shoes, I love it. Can you go ahead and mark them, Alex? When I was 19, I won a package on party poker while playing in my dorm that gave me an entry and trip and hotel to a tournament down in Australia. Oh, there we go. So I went down there for 10 days, uh, made some money in the tournaments, and fell in love with the place, decided I would go back for study abroad. So six months later, I moved back there. I would say it was probably the happiest period of my life. It was just, you know, online poker every day, hanging out with friends every evening, taking days off to go golfing or play tennis or go drinking with my friends. So I just kind of had like a very happy, balanced life where I was able to do a little of everything that I wanted. All right, that's suit number one. Let's go for suit number two. Mm -hmm. 
and it was my intention to stay down there, but unfortunately I was not able to acquire permanent residency, so I needed a new place to live in the U.S. on very short notice, which is why I now live in a pool house in my friend's backyard. Hey guys, what's up? How you doing? Come on in. Come on in. I'm living here in Las Vegas in the home of my friend uh, Andrew Lucky Chewy Lichtenberger. He bought this house after he had a really good 2009 World Series of Poker. And I moved into the pool house in spring 2010. This is Dan Smith, aka Dan. What up? What's happening? <laughs> Uh, and Mike, Mad Dog Watson. Awesome. Give him a bark. I'm kind of living in a sort of, a sort of a frat house scenario of poker players. There's not really any rules to the house. <laughs> it's just a bunch of young dudes living together, but you know, this time they actually have some money. I love living here. If I had to leave Melbourne for somewhere, I'm glad it was a nice house in Las Vegas with all my buddies who are better at poker than I am. Because I won We're the first even. game, right. and then you won two in a row. Yes. So then what, what am I up? I'm, I've been betting $100, so you are up 100 on me. I'm up 100, okay. I'm willing to <laughs> all my mind. <laughs> okay, Yoda. <laughs> the biggest difference that the money online poker provided me in life was a real direction for what I wanted to do in my life. I was a theater major in college, and I didn't really care about it, and I didn't want to do it, and... I knew that I wanted something that allowed me a large degree of autonomy, but would hopefully make me a fairly wealthy guy, and that was exactly oh. online poker. Plus, it allowed me the freedom to be whatever kind of person I wanted to be and hang out with whoever I wanted. So long as you could go home, log on, and play well enough to win, everything else you did was to your discretion. No. Wow! Oh! Yeah! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If there are two storms of the modern era in poker, they are as follows. Chris Moneymaker in 2003, winning the World Series of Poker. And the other storm, Mike Sexton, Party Poker, the World Poker Tour. Hi everyone, welcome to the World Poker Tour. We are coming to you aboard Holland America's MS Ryan Dam, home of the largest floating poker game in history. I'm Mike Sexton. And I'm Vince Van Patten, and this is the Party Poker Million the WPT was the first, really, to try to sell poker as like a tour and a sport. The river is a Not going to do it. Gus Hansen has won this tournament. I don't think it's hyperbole to say it was a phenomenon. People who would have never thought to watch poker on TV or really even played it that much were just kind of captivated by it. It didn't take long to realize something had happened here, something great. It was hitting the viewing public in a way that it really just absolutely resonated. Oh, 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 wow. Can you no one had ever seen anything like it. You go turn on every single week on Wednesday nights, watch this tournament, watching all these exciting people, and all of a sudden, there's a commercial break. Hey, wait a minute, that's the host. That's Mike Sexton. He was telling us about the hand, and now he's like, what's that thing called? Party what? Party poker? What's that? Let me check that out. The party poker ads made sure that when people opened their first online poker account, it was going to be with party poker. So the site didn't just grow, it, it exploded. Within 30 days, we multiplied our business by 10. We never looked back, it became the largest site in the world because of television. O3 to 06 was like the party poker era and the birth of modern online poker and the money was just easy. I do know that when I was making a lot of money at one point in time, I was looking up how to buy an island on eBay. <laughs> I, do, I do know that, that that was a real thing. I actually tried to figure out, there are islands for sale on eBay or there were at the time. I mean, it was a gold mine for a while. There was just so many games running and just so many recreational players. Like there was no reason for anybody to even like survey the competition. I was really bad back then and I was making so much money because people were just clueless. There were so many games, you could play so many hands and the games were just that easy. I don't know any point in history where young people with little to no education could learn something simple about a game and then just print money at it. It just basically provided a lot of people the opportunity for lifetime financial security at a very early age with minimal sacrifice.
it was such a relief when I started making good money in poker. I remember when I first started making a lot of money and I was living on my own in college, I had the most well-stocked kitchen and pantry you would ever find in your entire life. Because when I was growing up, getting groceries was like a huge treat. And having the cupboards full was something that, that happened at my friend's house. It didn't happen at my house. So that was like kind of a signal of like my financial success was that I always just had a ton of food in the house. And going grocery shopping was, it's still really exciting to me. Well, we had a situation where both kids, we had both of them at that time, and we didn't have gas. They shut our gas off. So we're borrowing, um, borrowing space heaters so we could get it warm enough for the kids in the house. So yeah, it was bad. It was stressful as a kid knowing that your parents are worried about money. I always felt like a sense of guilt if I needed something because I, I felt like it was just going to be an added burden. It was definitely a way of growing up that um, I always knew I didn't want my kids to ever have to feel like that. Well, Danny's obviously been doing so well at poker that she's buying Lori a horse that she's always wanted. She's always wanted a horse all her life. She really um, set me up good because we went to look at this, at this horse. Or actually, I went to watch her ride, and one of the stable people asked me if um, if I liked horses, and I said, "Oh, yeah, I love horses. I have 20 of them if I could." And Danny said, "Well, how about just one, Mom?" And that's how she told me she was buying me a horse. It was really sweet. It was really sweet. So it took me a while to figure out she wasn't pulling my leg. <laughs> Because she's good at that. <laughs> Is it okay? Let my mom's see. just kind of had some rough breaks in life. She's just kind of had some struggles that um, she's worked hard to get through. She's an amazing woman, and she deserves the best. So giving her a horse is just something that it would mean a lot to her, and it would mean a lot to me. Thank you for calling Poker Royalty. This is Brittany. How may I direct your call? My name is Brian Balsbaugh, and I am the founder of a poker talent agency called Poker Royalty. Poker Royalty is an agency that specializes in the poker industry. So we represent the best poker players in the world for sponsorships and licensing and endorsement deals and personal appearances and things like that. Basically, any way they can make money as celebrities away from the poker table. No one knew anything really about poker players prior to 2003. And now all of a sudden, you're seeing these guys who travel around the world, they live this kind of maverick independent lifestyle, they're playing pots for hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're winning a million, and the backstories were so interesting and fantastic that they were almost made up characters, you know, playing out in real life. The idea of poker royalty came to me one day while I was watching poker on television. I was watching ESPN and I saw six guys around a poker table and the camera couldn't go anywhere but their hats, their shirts. None of them had logos on and I knew that you know time on ESPN was valuable. I didn't know who would sponsor them or what the logos could or should be, but I knew that there was valuable inventory there that was not being utilized. And this is where I got lucky and all poker players got lucky because the online poker sites filled the void. They became the primary sponsors, the big sponsors, the companies that were funding poker and funding it at an unbelievable rate. My baseline was kind of the PGA Tour. If a guy goes through PGA Tour qualifying school, gets his card, he should expect somewhere between $150,000 and $200,000 a year you know, to wear a logo. So originally I started asking for that amount of money and we started getting it right away. So I started asking for a little bit more money, a little bit more money, and a little bit more money. And before you knew it, you know, we're doing seven-figure sponsorship deals, which blow away the numbers that I was doing in the PGA Tour. And as the boom hit, so did my business. Welcome back to the World Poker Tour. And don't change that dial, folks. We are The WPT came on when I was a senior in high school, and the moment I found it, 
that's what I did with my Wednesday nights. It was on for two hours from like 8 to 10, I think. And that's where I was every Wednesday from 8 to 10. It was just a great introduction to poker. They explained how the game was played. They tried to set up the personalities of the game. And I looked up to all these guys I saw on television and thought they just had the most glamorous, interesting lifestyle and that if you met them, they would be the most fascinating, charming, hilarious guy possible. And that was what I aspired to and looked up to. I was such a blatant fanboy during that era that I was looking for any way to get involved, just anything to get in contact with poker and be part of that world. Sean Gibson, Poker News Daily here with two of the stalwarts of the poker industry, Mike Sexton, Vince Van Patten. You guys are here. This is like I'm on American Idol. I mean, we're here for the raw deal. Uh, we've got people just off the street, people flying from all over, trying out for this new segment. This is a huge opportunity for, for just about anyone who loves poker. Well, it really is, and we're seeing all kinds of people try out for this role, honestly. Welcome back to the World Poker Tour. This is a brand new segment we like to call the raw deal. Ship it, Phil. Jam them. Your chips should have left skid marks there. Andy, you play like a donkey, hee-haw, and you get the prize. We engaged in extensive search. We had uh, open auditions. We had auditions online. We're looking for a character that's going to be opposite of us who's not afraid to scream out there, what a moron, what an idiot. How could this guy ever make it to the final table? This was a very risky decision. This could have, this could have been, quite frankly, a disaster. Tell us your name and where you're from. My name is Tony Dunst. I currently reside in Las Vegas, and I play poker for me. When I saw the audition form for what they were looking for, I jumped at the idea because I was like, that's me. They want a guy to act as I naturally act. If I see another professional poker player, acting like they're too cool for school, I have no qualms about calling them out. What they did for the first audition was show you a clip where at a final table at the Bay 101, Andy, Seth, uh, and Phil Helmuth get it in blind versus blind with Andy, Seth's ace jack versus Phil Helmuth's pocket queens. Andy hits an ace on the river. Phil like walks off the table and then he like crumples over into the fetal position and is just like having a Phil moment, whatever the hell that is. So when they did that audition, the line I came up with was, um, I like to think of Phil Hamuth as a clown in the literal sense, and that he is a man who will behave without dignity for a set fee, which I suppose you could also call a and seeing as that Phil was on his knees at the time, I'll allow you to make up your own mind. And uh you know, I felt like that was probably the line that stuck out a little bit, that I was going to take some gambles in you know, the interview process and uh, say some, you know, what I felt like was uh, the kind of outlandish things they were looking for. So the next day they called me while I was in the airport and said, we would uh, like to offer you a job. So here we are. I would say my poker dream is to, you know, someday obtain like a sponsorship. It would be nice to have a means to make some income without physically sitting at the table and playing poker. And I just think it'd be cool. It's just kind of like, it's the kid that grows up and wants to be in the NBA. It would be cool to have a team to identify with that. That's just something that I think it would just be a neat experience and something that I'd be really proud of. The best way to get sponsored really is to win a big tournament and get some media coverage that way. And this year I've decided to play more tournaments in the hopes of getting closer to that sponsorship goal. The idea that, you know, Danny might be traveling around more and, you know, attempting to get sponsorship and to be a personality in poker, I, th I think is, is great. All right, I'm up in a second. The security that being, being sponsored uh, would bring, uh, you know, I think is pretty valuable. Folks, it's tough to make these WPT final tables. Phil Ivey has done it eight times, more than any other player in the world. I call. Oh, boy. And he makes a call, He's done and it. Phil Ivey has done it. And it's over. Phil Ivey is our champion. I think Full Tilt Poker would be the best site to be sponsored by. Um, I feel kind of loyal, because it's just where I've played most of my career. And um, I think it'd be cool to kind of be on the same team, be sponsored by the same site as, you know, Phil Ivey.
The thing they did hands down better than anybody else at the beginning was marketing. Full Tilt's marketing campaign just looked Madison Avenue. This was play with the pros. We are the best. It was team Full Tilt. These were the big guys. Full Tilt Poker was, was essentially founded by Howard Lederer and Chris Jesus Ferguson. Jesus was the world champion and won the World Series of Main Event. Howard Lederer was a bracelet winner. You know, these aren't easy to win. Howard Lederer are... You know, they were players' players. Like, everyone knew who they were. They were definitely the cool kids in school. I mean, they, they built a team of players that everyone wanted to know about and play against and be like. What, you think because you dress like me, you could play like me? When Full Tilt started, they definitely recognized that Ivy was a real star. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Ivy. He might not have been number one, but he quickly became the number one player in the world. I'm joined by a man who only needs one name, Ivy. The bigger Phil Ivy got, the bigger Full Tilt Poker got. I feel very flattered when people say uh, that I'm the best player. These celebrities weren't just endorsing Full Tilt. You know, they're part owners. So if you wanted to play on a site, you felt it was safe because this is where the pros are playing. To learn chat and play with the pros, go where they live, fulltiltpoker.com. They were massively successful. And I know that they believed in their business model. Ray Vitar, the CEO of fulltiltpoker.net. On behalf of fulltiltpoker.net, I'd like to present this first place check. Oh no, no, no one knew who Ray was before, before he got into poker. He was just a day trainer living in LA and he just happened to be sharing the same space as Chris, Chris Ferguson. Full Tilt Poker was owned and operated by professional poker players who didn't necessarily have business experience. From 10 feet away, I can throw a playing card through a carrot. But, once again, they were making money. How have you felt so far about your new role in the World Poker Series? Um, I feel great about it. It's quite a shock and everything. I mean, it all happened very, very quickly for me, and uh, you know, I've barely been living in this country uh, that long, and they offered me a job. So what's your strategy, given the structure, the field, the craziness? My intention is to get drunk and see where it takes me. Yeah. I'm Mike Sexton. On behalf of myself, Vince Van Patten, Kimberly Lansing, Tony Dunst, and the Royal Flush Girls, we want to welcome you to the most fun event on the World Poker Tour, the WPT Invitational. Hello, how are you doing? Don, right? Tony, nice to meet you. Hey, Don. Hey, man. Good to see you again, too. It's pretty surreal to be attending this event, working for the WPT, and mingling with some mainstream celebrities, as well as these poker celebrities who, you know, maybe even months earlier had no idea who I was, and now I'm very much a part of the fabric of the poker community. There you go, man. Thank you. No sweat. It's just weird. Weird how it works out. So do you go to all the, um, you go to all the tournaments? No, not yet. They've only got me uh, contracted for the West Coast stuff, um, Las Vegas, and the event in Indiana. Uh, whether okay. that is extended in the following years and they want me all over the states, over to Europe, things like that, yet to be seen. Uh, I guess it kind of depends on how the season goes for the WPT, what the reception is like for the segment, but I have no experience of being a professional at anything. I've spent eight years without a responsibility or obligation in the world. And, you know, as much as I appreciate all this and I love the fact that they actually gave me a shot at being a real person again, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm at Commerce Casino. I'm going to play the LAPC and the 10K main event. I'm late right now. I'm like 20 minutes late, but that's all right. I like showing up late anyways, because I don't like being sitting at the table while everybody walks up. It just makes me nervous. Blood starts in seat number one. The blinds are 1,500. Please shuffle up and deal. Hi. Is that your number, the one you called me with? Yeah, yeah. Just to have on my phone. What, what was your name, Noel? Noel. Nice to meet you. I'm Danielle. Nice to meet you. Thanks. You got Full
give me a rake back deal, so I just get some extra rake back. So it's not a sponsorship, but it's just um, more so something that I think it's at least developing a relationship with them, and hopefully it can lead to something more in the future that would be pretty sweet. So. My whole poker career, I've pretty much always been in school. So I've never really fully given poker my attention. And I think I just want to know what I can do. Obtaining a sponsorship for me is more of like a confirmation of my achievements. It's somebody else like affirming that, yeah, I've, I've proven myself as a poker player. I've never really been interested in the, the sponsorship of poker or the, the celebrity of poker. I, I mean, for me, it's all about the game. A lot of people ask me like, you know, oh, online poker, that's not real poker. Uh, like, how can you like understand what someone's doing if you can't see them? And the example I always give is that like, if the six best poker players were playing live poker with each other, I mean, these guys don't have poker face. They're, well, they've all got a really good poker face. They're not giving away tells physically, or not many. So, I mean, if these guys were playing, would they just be flipping coins with each other? Of course not. They're playing some game. So, I mean, that's exactly what online poker is. It's just like six guys with really good poker faces playing poker together. It used to be that poker was something that People played in person, over the table. There was no record of what happened. You only got to play 20 or 30 hands an hour. It was a very slow moving game. It was very hard to get an idea of who was winning and who was losing and what was working and what wasn't. Before online poker, everyone was terrible at the game. It's such a complex game and you know they were playing tic-tac-toe when they were trying to play chess. Nowadays with online poker, people have so many software programs. You can calculate the odds of any situation you want. You can draw complex trees saying, you know, if this guy does this on the flop and this guy does this on certain turn cards, what's the equity when this river card comes? Because people were able to play so many hands of online poker in a short period of time, all of a sudden people were able to access pieces of statistical information that they never had seen before. You know, people were able to say like, you know, how did I fare with pocket aces over the last 20,000 hands? Like, 20,000 hands is probably more hands than most live poker players have played in their lifetime. And, uh, that, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you know, 20,000 hands is a lot of hands. And so now all of a sudden it was like, we can prove things statistically that anybody that understands basic math can understand. The internet really created an exponential increase in skill. Not only were you able to get so many hands faster, you know, you don't need a dealer, you can play 10 tables at a time, so maybe you're getting 20 times as many hands but also it created a web, a sharing network, where people were just able to feed ideas off of each other and learn so quickly. I think what people haven't realized yet though, is poker still in its infancy, and I really believe over the next 10 years, we'll feel the same way about ourselves as we do about the live players 10 years ago. The players 10 years from now are just gonna be so much better than us. In any given hand of poker, there's just a huge amount of different things that flutter through your mind. It's a game that not only has this kind of technique element, like, you know, the math and the strategy of the game, like any game, like chess or something, there's also like a massive human element, which is equally complex. At the end of the day, like every player plays differently and, and you really have to understand what someone else is thinking about. It, it's really like a mind reading trick. And, and the cards are kind of like clues as to what the person is thinking about during a hand. And, and the better you can kind of read the cards, the more you can pull off the like gypsy mind reading trick. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. So I'm playing 4080 Melman Oldham. 
Heads up. I had $35,000. Effective stacks are about 450 big blinds. I'm on the button with pocket turns. Raise 10s on the button to 240. He pots it to 720. He was three betting something around 22%. Definitely the play right here is to call. The flop comes out ace, 10, 7, all clubs. And that 10 comes on the flop. It's just a monster flop for you. There's about $1,400 in the pot, and he bets $800. It's on the smaller side. And this board texture, it's a little bit suspicious. Because of that, I decided to call. He turns the eight of spades. Now my opponent checks. I take that as a sign of him giving Could up. Could mean he's giving up. Could mean he's trapping us. Pot's about 3000 and I bet about 2,600. And he check raises me to 10,800. You can have a weak ace, you can have any pair between king, queen, tens and king jack, queen jack with one club. I have 10 cards that could give me a full house. 23% of the high. time we're going to I also do a hand that he basically can so I call. And the river comes a king. The river's the king of spades. And he shoves for basically a pot. jams. It's an absurdly big bet. He knows that he's only representing very strong king hand. High flush, queen high flush. Or bluff. The mass says to call here. If I'm not calling 30%, 40%, it's not a super strong hand. So I'd probably make the call with pocket tens. Today we're at the Commerce working on raw deal segments. Usually my producers just email me some files, take a look at those, and then write my own segments. Hey everyone, I'm here with Tony Dunce, the new host of the Raw Deal. Please tell us what that entails. Well, Julio, what's going to happen is I'm going to pop up once or twice an episode and really just get a moment to speak on whatever I'd like to about probably about the strategy of a hand that we just witnessed or perhaps something that's going on in the episode as far as players' conduct, behavior, and what's going on in poker in general. Now you have a blog and card player. You're known for telling it like it is. Are you going to do the same on the show? Uh, I, I certainly hope so, and I've been encouraged to do precisely that. This segment will be one of the first times in televised poker that the public gets to see the perspective of the young, online generation. I feel a little pressure because I want my generation of players to respect what I put out there and I want to make us look good, make us look like we're the ones that really know what's going on with poker. So I want to be an appropriate ambassador. I want to make you know my friends and the guys who grew up teaching me poker look smart. Right now, I'm just getting a lot of really good cards. I think my table thinks that I'm really crazy aggressive, and um, actually I've just had legitimately good hands, so if I could just keep picking up pocket kings, that'd be nice. <laughs> I think I'm right now at about 110, 115K. Danielle Anderson here on day three of the LAPC. We're at 126 players now. Okay. You're one of them. Yes. An extremely, uh, well, short stack, right? I now. was extremely short stack. I just doubled, doubled up. up. So, yeah. And you said you got better. lucky. Tell us about that. Well, I was real short, and uh, it was pretty much the first semi decent hand I'd had that somebody hadn't opened the pot. So I had Jack 10, and I shoved, got snap called by somebody I thought for sure he had a big hand. But he had pocket eight, so we were racing. I was pretty happy with that. And I hit a 10 on the yes. river, so nice little double up for me. Yeah, so what do you got? a little bit of breathing room. Um, at about 89K or okay, something like that. Okay, good. So, yeah, good. a little bit of room. The last time we spoke, it was at Borgata, or that was yeah. the first time. It wasn't yeah. too long ago, back in September. And you really felt like a newbie, and well, you were. Yeah. And now, it just, it's, it's so different. I mean, you know everyone, yeah. and it's just, yeah. how does it feel? It's fun. I feel like I'm, you know, it's like a nice transition into the tournament world. It's nice to, like, recognize people and see familiar faces. And I've kind of made some friends, so... Even when I'm traveling alone, I have people to talk to and hang out with. Well, continue the good luck. Thanks. And uh, well, you're, you're okay now. Yeah, I got a little more breathing room than I had, so good. I'm feeling pretty good. good. Chip in a chair, right? Exactly, <laughs> or 89,000. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks much, it's good seeing you. You too. Coming back from this world where you have no responsibilities, no obligations, no timetables or deadlines or anything like that, and then trying to plug you back in where you've got all these people relying on you being prompt and punctual, the difficult part has been the responsibility. 
I, f I fucked up an interview yesterday where I missed it. I got a, my flight was delayed. I forgot to message my correspondent at the WPT and inform of this. Then the people who were doing the interview tried to call me while I was just about to take off, and it was a disaster, and I felt like a total asshole. Uh, you know, it turned out that I had, like, gone six days without emailing my correspondent at the WPT. I had no idea. I, had, I feel like a dick about it, but I just had no idea that six days had passed. They just seemed to click away. I don't want to be a bad employee, and I don't have this attitude like, I don't have to do this shit, I don't want to do these things. I want to do them, but I'm definitely concerned that six years of habit are going to be very hard to break, and I'm going to continue making those kind of mistakes, even though I do not intend to. I am not... Uh, I am not sure to what degree of, of trouble I am in currently. My position is tenuous and temporary, and if they decide that I'm not what they're looking for, or the segments didn't turn out that well, or I'm a hassle to deal with, they can just cut me. Bluffing, and I was letting him bluff. I had pocket jacks and the sideboard. I knew he was. I don't. God, I almost. I was just gonna let him keep bluffing at me because I knew he was just gonna keep firing at me. Fuck my life. There's two minutes. We're changing off the hundred dollar chips. Hundred dollar chips will not be two minutes. If one player tries to follow those chips, we'll do a longer break. We're gonna have a break in two minutes, and we're changing off all the hundred dollar chips. Thank you. Nice playing with you guys. Jay? No, it's all good. What can you do? I think I should have called. What's that? I'll be all right. I got stuff in my hotel room, yeah. Oh, if I'd known that, I'd have called the last hand. Yep. See you later, boss. I'm out. Bought him for 10,000, played for three days, and I go home empty-handed, so. It's dejecting, it's not fun. Of course you want to make it, but, you know, I kind of know some of the WPT staff, and uh, I've gotten to know some of the regular players, and so, yeah, I think every tournament that I'm at helps me get me closer to that, you know, goal of the sponsorship. Most of the people in Washington, D.C. don't have any interest in gambling whatsoever. Gambling is a state issue, not a federal issue. That's why you can have Utah and Nevada share a border and completely different laws on gambling. But the operators are in other countries. So it was unclear whether internet poker was really legal or illegal. And even if it was illegal, who could do anything about it? The Department of Justice hated internet poker, but they did not have the weapons they need to close it down. You gotta have a defendant who is physically present in the United States, and you need a good statute that makes an activity illegal. 
They didn't have the statute. The best they could use was the Wire Act, which is a statute passed in 1961 designed to go after telegraph wires for horse races. It's kind of like using stone tools to do brain surgery. Um, it might work, but it's extremely messy. So they want a bill passed that will clearly state that the Wire Act covers internet poker. And year after year, Republicans in the House of Representatives keep introducing bills to try to make internet gambling expressly illegal. This is a scourge on our society. And they would pass one house and not another. Or they'd pass out of committees, but not pass the house. What we had in 2006 was the majority leader of the U.S. Senate is Bill Frist, Republican from Tennessee. He's the one who pushed through the only bill that ever passed, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act. And how this uh, happened is really a, an, an incredible story, and really an affront to democracy. How y'all doing? Good to say hello. Good to see you. Yes, indeed. Let's the speculation is that Bill Frist wanted to try to make a, a presidential run, and that this was a way of trying to shore up his um, his evangelical base. Are we going to lead or are we going to follow? And the Republicans, as we all know, have a clear cut vision of where we're going to take this country. And he didn't care about internet gambling either. But Jim Leach, who's a very powerful Republican from Iowa, does care. He wants to outlaw internet gambling. Internet gambling is crack cocaine for gamblers. You just click the mouse and lose your house. Iowa, of course, is the state with the first presidential primaries. So Bill Frist figures, well, a good way to win over Jim Leach and establish his bona fide credentials with the extreme right wing is to outlaw internet gambling. As it is now, this industry threatens to undermine the quality of life of millions of Americans by bringing an addictive behavior right into our living rooms. But they couldn't get enough votes for, uh, for Congress to pass a bill that would pass both houses. Nobody cares about, cared about the issue. Bill Frist saw an opportunity by attaching it to a must-pass piece of legislation, the Safe Port Act. No one in their right mind was going to vote against the Ports Act, which is essentially a national security policy. The Safe Port Act had passed both the House of Representatives and the Senate. They go to conference committee at like 1 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. It was at that point that at the past of Senator Frist, the language for the UIGEA was then inserted into the conference report. No hearings, no discussion, no chance to even read the bill. It was essentially thrust down and to a certain extent hidden by those who passed the law. The Safe Port Act will make this nation more prepared, more prosperous, and more secure. There's comments from members of the Senate and House of Representatives say this is not the way laws are supposed to be made. What does banning internet gaming have to do with port security? What kind of social, cultural, authoritarianism are we advocating here? This section was added to the bill in an attempt to fire up the far-right anti-gaming element in time for this year's election. The Republican simply rammed it through and they said you don't like it then vote against the safe port act and we will campaign against you that you're in favor of terrorism it's that kind of process that was engaged in that really upset a lot of people the senate changes the people who serve in this body change but what doesn't change is that every one of us who serves believes deeply in the genius of the American democracy. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The UIGEA does only two things. It made it a crime to accept money for illegal gambling and then it was supposed to create regulations that would prevent payment processors, banks, and others from sending money from the U.S. to operators. The processing from players to operators and then operators back to players to pay their winnings is the lifeblood of the business. UIGEA was an attempt to sever that. It became harder and harder for Americans to simply get their money to a site. So the 
payment processors, the middlemen, the e-wallets, filled that void. The financial industry in response to the UIGEA became much riskier and as a result, much more expensive and much more creative in terms of how they would process transactions for the internet poker operators. When the UIGEA hit, every online poker site serving US customers had a big decision to make. Were they going to leave the market or were they going to push their luck and, and stay in the market? Party Poker, who was the biggest site in the world at the time, chose to leave the market, while Poker Stars in Full Tilt chose to stay. Keep in mind, Party Poker was the industry leader. The world's largest online poker site essentially says, we are leaving the United States market. That's a remarkable thing. Party Poker was a publicly traded company. They have to answer to shareholders, they have uh, commerce regulations they have to follow. Poker Stars in Full Tilt, private ownership. They just have to decide whether or not personally they want to take the risk. There was a risk, but there was also a huge reward. Once Party Poker left the market, it became a wide open race between Poker Stars and Full Tilt. Every year that passed after the UIGEA, they got a little more bold. I'm all in. Poker Stars and Full Tilt aggressively went after television shows. Full Tilt created Poker After Dark, Poker Stars had the big game, and the two were constantly battling for online poker supremacy. These are the top two teams, and it's inevitable that one wants to up the other. We're very proud today to announce Tom Dwan as the newest member of Team Fulton. They paid me $11 billion. <laughs> and I, I, I was like, look, holding out for 12, 12 a billion, but all I got was 11 dollars There was definitely like discussion, what's the better site? But I think that, in a sense, helped both. Kind of like the Coke Pepsi situation, where they became the two that elevated each other. The prey doesn't stop. The players continue to play. The money keeps rolling in. And whatever Party Poker was making in 2004 and 5, it's tripled, doubled, quadrupled, whatever. By 2011, Poker Stars is by far the world's largest poker room, operating in hundreds of different countries all over the world. Poker Stars aggressively went after the international market. PokerStars.com. So they're branching out all over the world, whereas Full Tilt decided, hey, we're just going to focus on the American market. It's a king! king. <laughs> The success of Poker Stars after their global marketing showed that online poker could be bigger than anyone expected. We thought it was big with party poker, and Poker Stars took it to a new level. We are the world champion right here. With the passing of the UIGA, there was a noticeable kind of shift in like what was what started popping up on your online tables. I mean, you started finding that rather than having like three out of six players be professional players, maybe five out of six were professionals and the sixth guy was actually pretty good. I guess it became more defined how good you could actually be. Like it wasn't just like good, average, bad. It was like good, better really, really good. You know, it got a bit more specific as to how good, really good players were. For a while online, there was definitely this online culture of people kind of testing their metal against each other that almost came to the like point of hilariousness where everyone would play anyone at any moment. Like, oh, I've made a fair bit of money playing poker. Let's see how good I actually am at it. Even if it costs me a bit of money to find out. People just want to play the biggest stakes there is. They wake up in the morning and they're like, I want to play the biggest stakes poker there is. And some amount of those people want to play bigger stakes than there has been. It sort of happened overnight that Full Tilt Poker became, you know, the epicenter for the biggest cash games online. The nosebleed games, as they call them, were just 
amazing. Uh, you've never even imagined that games could be this big on the internet. For a while, there were a bunch of 500,000 no limit hold'em ring games, and millions changed hands between the biggest winners and losers. Nobody could believe this was real money. These were bigger than, than most of the big live games. The most I've ever won in a session was uh, 1.6 something million. It's tough to, to play nosebleeds exclusively for a living because the swings are just massive. When online poker started having games so high stakes that you could lose $500,000 in a single session, it was just a fan's wet dream. It sort of created the circus-like atmosphere where people wanted just to log on to Full Tilt just to watch. I think it makes sense, you know, they have right at their computer the ability to watch, you know, $200,000 pots that are real. I've played my fair share of nosebleed stakes. I guess the highest I've really played a lot of mileage at is 100-200. Strangely enough, it didn't actually really feel that weird to start playing these stakes. I, I guess after playing for sort of five years at the time, your desensitivity to swings and money had, like, or at least mine, had become so kind of strong that once you started playing and winning and losing like $200,000 in a day, it just kind of felt like natural, which is why I guess as an observer, even one that plays poker, uh, watching people play higher than that seems insane, like winning and losing a million dollars, but I guess they just had that same feeling on a, a scale above me, uh, for better or worse. As much as I love being a poker player, I think it's one of the most emotionally challenging professions I can think of. Obviously everybody has stress at work, but a poker player can actually lose money at work and can lose money at work for months at a time, for a whole year. Well, the main psychological challenge the poker player is faced with is just that, you know, a lot of the time you just lose a lot of money and you lose constantly. Like, there's no professional poker player who hasn't had at least one or maybe two just demoralizing, long losing stretches where the cards aren't running well for you and then you lose your confidence and then you have to figure out whether or not you're playing well. And the problem with poker is that a lot of times your results don't actually correlate with your skill over like a given month, let's say. So you can be playing really, really well and losing money and it's not as if you know you're playing really well because there's so much uncertainty, you know? When you go through a downswing as a poker player, the difficult part is not the money you lost. Uh, the difficult part is that it makes you question your ability to make money in the future. So if I go on a, a $800,000 downswing, what's tough is not the $800,000 I lost. I mean, it's tough. What's tough is, what if I can't beat this game anymore? What if I can't beat it for as much as I could have? And now my, over the next 10 years, expectation of making $20 million or whatever it is, I lost that. Even when it's obvious, even when it should be obvious that you know, you just got unlucky, it doesn't matter. Everyone will question themselves. They'll say, maybe I'm just not that good. Maybe the last three years have just been, you know, a fluke. You know, maybe I should have been losing all this time and I just got lucky and now the reality is just setting in. And it can be very hard to, you know, break away from that and, and, and remain objective. You're always being tested, always. For most people, online poker and poker in general tends to be better suited for part-time players, not professionals, because the added stress of having a family life or having children can often be the tipping point for people to uh, really struggle mentally with some of the highs and lows uh, of the game. Right before UIGEA, I was on a really big downswing in poker, and I was kind of at like an all-time low. I hated playing, I hated. Every single time I sat down at that computer to put in a session, there was a possibility that things were just gonna go terrible and that I was gonna end up feeling like I wanted to curl up into a ball and die. At that point, my thought was that it, it wasn't worth all the emotion that was going on. You know, it was like poker almost controlled who she was kind of at that time. You know, if it was a good day in poker, you know, it was a good day at our house. If it was a bad day at poker, you know, it was a bad day at our house. I would say at that point I was like bordering on depression just with every single 
losing session, every single loss, every single bad beat, every single downswing, it just, it stuck with me and it, I couldn't go about my daily activities without it like hanging over my head and just bringing me down. I was heavy into gambling. I can give you a story. After work one day, and we didn't, I didn't make much money back then. Neither one of us did really. And I stopped at a bar with my sister and I cashed my check. I'd spent all that in pull tabs, and then turned around and borrowed my sister's check. So both checks are just about gone. But the people there knew me well enough, they let me buy the box out. And I broke about, lost about $100. Well, I felt like I just won because at least I had enough to pay my sister back and still have come home to Lori with money. Otherwise, two paychecks would have been gone. Seeing what he went through with his problem gambling definitely made me more aware of my own habits with poker. I kind of worried a little bit about like, maybe I genetically have that in me and I just haven't, you know, given it the opportunity to escape, kind of. So when she said she's going to professional gambling, it, it I mean, it, it scared the hell out of me because I know what we could have had in life and we didn't get in life because of me. Probably one of the biggest things that changed was more when Danny got pregnant with Easton um, is when she really, she made a, a big commitment to, you know, controlling her emotions. Hi. Hi. I missed you today. How are you? When I got pregnant with Easton, that was a huge turning point in my poker career. Um, it just gave me just so much more drive and devotion to, you know, to being responsible. It was different when she was pregnant because she didn't have that choice to be able to react emotionally because she knew that it affected our family and that it would affect Easton. Now I can, you know, I can sit here and be doing something across the room and, you know, I'll ask her how our session went and uh, I lost 5,000 or something like that, you know, and I didn't, I didn't notice. Everything was going great, but I kind of felt like I just wanted to make sure that I had a backup plan and that I had something to fall back on. So I decided to go back to school. Once she got the RN, then I relaxed because it was like, all right, you're a professional poker player, but you also don't rely on that the rest of your life. You have something to fall back on. I think that's important. Now I just have all the confidence in the world of her. All right, Jeremy, you can either hang out and watch the tournament or you can pay me back. Well, when can you pay me back if I lend you? Hang out and watch. What's that? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we are going to watch the premiere of The Raw Deal on the World Poker Tour and just kind of hang out, play a little blind man's bluff poker, and I don't know, just relax, enjoy. This is a handicap. <laughs> this is not fair. I got a dog's ass in my face. <laughs> yeah, I think my friends will tell me if they think it sucks. Well, the crown all is this good? I can bet. Yeah, yeah, it's no limit. It's no limit. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. It's very, very, very bad. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I'm nervous, but I am excited to see how it turns out because it took a couple of goes to get this right. And yeah, I'm just curious how it will turn out and what people's reactions will be. That's cool. Yeah. I got the ace out though. I was like, yeah. that was gonna crack the spot off. You got too many chips on you. You yeah. just gotta keep them honest. This season on the WPT, we have a new feature which brings you more than five. Yeah. This may be it. Hi, I'm Tony Dorn, known online as Bond 18. Let's take a closer look at that last hand. There's a problem with that handsome gentleman. John Carradad, simply because he has the ball to try and block the light. However, the river bluff is a clear mistake, and here's why. First is the sign price at nearly four to one to make a call with anything in his range that has showdown value. Second, I think John is fairly to think about. Poker has not just provided a few things to my life; it has given me my life. 
One day I was on my couch watching this show and these people who back then I all thought were superstars of poker and amazing at the game and you know personalities I would never have a chance to meet and now I'm the guy who crafts petty insults at them. And it's so absurd. This is Dixie. Dixie. Hi, baby. Hi. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? Yeah, what do you think? Mm -hmm. It's just surreal to me that Danny is buying me this horse because it's something that I never thought would happen. I, I never thought I'd be able to have a horse again. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for Danny and, and for her poker plan, it never would have happened. What do you think? Huh? I think my mom already loves the horse. I'm guessing we're gonna leave having purchased a new horse. I'm pretty excited to, for her to have a horse to just, I don't know, make her happy. I play poker because I love poker, because I'm good at poker. I work my way up through like the bottom and I'm really proud of where I like have ended up. When I found out sitting around on a computer playing cards for a living was something you could actually do, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm gonna do with my life. Poker's definitely given me the opportunity to live life outside of the conventional system. It's given me the opportunity to, to allow myself to be happy. Poker's not just a game, it's so wrapped up in every other aspect of my life that it's like kind of become a part of my identity. It's a multi-billion dollar industry with millions of participants, and on Friday, it was shut down by federal agents. The FBI seized the domain names of poker stars, Full Tilt Poker and Absolute Poker, and prosecutors charged 11 people with fraud, money laundering, and illegal gambling. We'd heard rumors of the skies falling plenty of times, but this time it really felt like it was. Sites were shut down, people's funds were frozen, the DOJ and federal government issued statements saying, you know, basically it's over, guys. Now with charges of bank fraud and money laundering, it's clear that the, uh, the focus of the prosecutor's case is on payments. The federal government alleges that individuals lied to U.S. banks by setting up false businesses to act as conduits for internet gaming payments, being disguised as something else, miscoding transactions. The sites to get money from the players in the United States to them and vice versa had to be lying to the banks. There's no doubt that that was going on. The federal government seized money all over the world and they froze the accounts of all the players. For players that relied on online poker as their main source of income, all of a sudden, you know, the tap is gone. There's essentially panic. It's like 1929, I run on the bank. People are like, get my money, I need to get my 500, I need to get my 5,000. I mean, there's really a run on the bank and a panic. And the entire poker world essentially blows up. This is a declaration of war by the United States against these companies. The sites were stamped with the official seals of the FBI and the Department of Justice. I mean, that's intimidating shit. You know, one day you're an online poker player, and the next day you're an outlaw. People were wondering if they would ever get their money back, and nobody knew these answers. Their money was gone, their jobs were gone, everyone was lost. The entire poker world will remember April 15th, 2011. The United States of America was the biggest market. It was the most lucrative market, and it was the one that all of the sites wanted to target. It's gone now. It's completely gone. And all the money that they were spending, you know, in my estimation, three to four hundred million dollars a year in order to get new American customers is gone. It was a huge blow to, to the online poker community when they realized, okay, this is legitimately the end of online poker as we know it because there were no sites ready to, to, to step in. There was no 
next step. I would advise everyone not to wait it out in any way. I think online poker is gone from America probably forever. At first, I was just kind of like, oh, people might be overreacting a little bit, you know? And then as I read more and as I realized that they were, like, arresting these people and um, and some very, like, reputable people in the poker world were saying that, you know, this is, like, the apocalypse of poker. Like, this is, this is it. Like, as of right now, I don't have a job and I have you know, a decent amount of my my personal assets are online right now, and I, I don't know what the state is of that. I don't know if I'll get that back or not. Um, so I just kind of panicked, and I called my mom and was kind of trying to tell her what was going on, and I just started bawling, and then I kind of sat here and just all day was kind of glued to the computer reading updates, and I cried like a little girl. <laughs> The average public, anyways, I don't think probably understands what this means for like thousands and thousands of poker players, you know? There's some people on the poker forums and stuff who are like 95% of their net worth like wrapped up in these online sites. And right now it's in limbo. Like we're all hoping that we're going to get our money back and we'd like to be optimistic, but really we don't know, you know? I think like the hardest part of this is that like, my goals are like gone. Like I'm not gonna get the chance to even like, I don't I don't even get the chance to accomplish my goals, you know? Um, Cause a lot of my life goals were just tied up in poker and poker is what I was best at, you know? It's like, I derive like a lot of my like pride and a lot of my, um, I guess some like confidence just from poker because I was good at something. And it was just really hard to think that like, I'm not even gonna get the chance, you know? You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy, the skies are great. You never know, I mean, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. I would describe the mood in the poker community post Black Friday as a combination of panic, outrage, and befuddlement. You've got a bunch of people who probably anticipated that they were going to have an income for a long time. Not only did they have their funds frozen, but anything they were planning on doing with like future money yet to be generated, that's all gone. Then you've got the people who had jobs within the industry that were principally funded by the sites. They're fucked. You've got people in my position who thought they had money, but now aren't really sure if they have money and might get taxed on money that's essentially been made imaginary to them, but is not imaginary to the IRS. And that's really fucked up to think that your government's gonna both take away your source of income, but then tax you on the income that you sort of kind of made by means they essentially deemed illegal. It's like, it, I mean, what do you say to that? If going back to Australia was truly a, a viable possibility for me, then of course I would consider it. But right now I've got a very good thing going on with the World Poker Tour. I love my job. Um, but if that didn't exist, I probably would be looking for some way out, out of this country. Uh, be it Europe, Australia, New Zealand, something to get out from under this bullshit.
as a Canadian living in Montreal, Black Friday didn't originally have like a, a large impact on my day to day life. You know, I, I woke up in the morning and played the same games I was always playing. It was kind of funny not to see some of the faces I'd always seen, but uh, you know, the games were actually, I, I found them a lot more fun at first because they were all European players I was playing with and there tends to be a kind of subtle difference in how people play the game across the uh, Atlantic. It's a little confusing to me that the country that has the hit song, you gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, would ban online poker. Like, it's, it's just a very American game and it ties in positively, I think, with a lot of the things that Americans consider, like a lot of the ideology that Americans consider important, like the idea that anyone has a shot given that they work hard and they have the aptitude to get where they wanna go, uh, that life is a meritocracy. Uh, poker is kind of like a great form where the, those kind of ideologies are expressed. I think a lot of people had basically written off their money. There's just this real kind of misanthropic kind of poker mindset <laughs> towards it where people just didn't think they were getting paid back and there's a lot of talk of, you know, the sky is falling and such. The big news of the week, uh, we got to get to right away. Poker Stars and Full Tilt Poker both signed deals, Adam, with the DOJ for the sole purpose of allowing U.S. players to cash out their balances. I'm happy to announce that uh, the Poker Stars will be processing cash outs uh, very, very soon. The best case scenario is Tuesday. A couple weeks after Black Friday, Poker Stars actually paid back all the players. So I think people were pretty happy about that, even if there was some anxiety about, you know, the economy as a whole. There's definitely a sort of trend of anxiety running through the poker community right now about what Full Tilt's planning to do. I mean, they haven't released any statements. They haven't released any player funds. Where is the money, Full Tilt? Where is it? I fully expected Full Tilt to have paid out by now. As much as it's, it's shocking at this point that they haven't paid out, can you imagine a scenario where they don't? At this point, I'd say the chances of getting paid back seem pretty high just because you know, Full Tilt's revenues are kind of not hidden. I have a fair amount of money on there that I'd kind of like to get back. After Black Friday happened, I felt like people weren't actually getting the story and I felt like there was a lot of important stuff that was happening. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars were at stake and people's livelihoods were at stake and nobody knew what was going on. So I started an independent poker news site to do that right, and it turned out to be a real trip. A lot different than I expected. Really all anyone cared about um, for the like nine or so months that, that Subject Poker existed um, was full tilt, and that's really all we cared about too. Everything else was just tangential. I joked about being a spy constantly. <laughs> like we were talking to a lot of anonymous sources and you know we were looking through corporate documents that we weren't supposed to have and we were getting all this insider information, we were breaking all these stories and it just got really, really intense because Full Tilt had $300 million of players' money locked up and that's a really big deal. Um, and it was just sort of perpetually sinking in how big of a deal that was. Full Tilt lost money in a lot of dumb ways. There was the $128 million shortfall, which was quite remarkable. And the DOJ did in fact seize about $159 million from the company. But by far the largest way that money flowed out of Full Tilt was by distributions. They gave themselves massive distributions. They paid themselves $10 million a month. Maybe at the peak of their profitability, which was probably all the way back in 2007, they were making that much. But they were a losing company in uh, 2010, early 2011, and they were still paying themselves $10 million a month. In addition to that, they also hired a huge stable of sponsored players. 
a lot of them were paid 100,000 a year, and some of them were paid, you know, 500,000, a million dollars a year, just to wear this little piece of felt. They paid their gambling partners and their friends enormous amounts of money. And when players are sending emails into support and saying, hey, how do you keep player funds? <laughs> they always got the same answer. Player funds are safe and secure. We keep them segregated. And that was just a blatant lie. At some point, they stopped splitting up player funds from their operational expenses. They started to simply spend money, have their marketing budget, pay their own salaries, pay their own dividends from players' funds. Howard Letterer, Ray Vitar, those guys said specifically, tell players that funds are segregated, but funds were not. The pool that they were meant to be holding for players, that they said they were holding for players, that money's gone. As, as an owner of Full Tail Poker, uh, I took and I take full responsibility for what happened. And what happened wasn't right, and it caused a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And, um, and in some cases, just inconvenience for three million customers. And um, that, that, that wasn't right. For that, I'm truly sorry. A big part of what made poker really appealing back in like 2003 when this big boom started were these celebrities. These celebrities had this awesome appeal of being sort of old school gamblers and sort of having all the color and sort of almost cowboyishness that goes with that. Also, the appeal of being sort of remarkably honorable, the sort of honorable gambler. Even though it's sort of obvious in hindsight, like here are these guys who had these pasts that were sort of very shady coming in and holding hundreds of millions of dollars for us. From an outside perspective, that sounds like a really sketchy situation, but when you're actually in it, when we were actually in it, we were really fooled. As a result of Black Friday, all the boys that were living here realized that without online poker available to them, there wasn't much point in being here in the United States. So they all moved abroad, mostly to Canada. That's where uh, Chewy, uh, Aaron, and Dan ended up, all in Toronto. And as a result, the house has been empty since. It's odd because it is so large and I don't actually live in the physical house itself. I live out the back, so every day I walk into this just empty, silent uh, house that's not even quite mine. My money on Full Tilt is essentially in a state of limbo. I try and stay well read on the issue to see what's gonna happen, but there's so much hearsay. It, it still now is just so hard to believe that something that had been around for almost a decade and it had, to our knowledge, no financial trouble, suddenly imploded overnight. Um, I've heard more stories than I can count about people who have what would essentially be life-changing money locked up in their full tilt account. A lot of people just kept most of what they had on whatever site they played the most at. Um, so there are people with five or six figures that would, you know, completely make or break their life. And then there are some guys who were high stakes cash players or who had a huge tournament score, who had seven figures locked up on there. So it's been really bad for some people. Uh, so, during the period in which the house has been empty, mostly been occupying myself reading. Uh, let's do that in here. Uh, for a long time, I had two piles, the must-read pile and the have-read pile. Usually, I just, like, grab something off the must-read pile, post up on my couch, and with the highlighter, sit there for hours on end. After Black Friday, I realized I was going to have to stay in the United States because of my job with the WPT. So, I started working on my first original book. I wouldn't necessarily call this book a memoir, but it is 
a pretty clear look of what it's like to play online poker or poker for a living as a young adult. And a lot of the things I was able to do over the course of my life and then write upon in this book are a result of the freedom and resources that playing poker for a living allowed me. It's been a great ride, what can you say? Like it was, it was an awful lot of fun and I still think there is some money to be made in poker, but the, the poker of, of my memories and, and young adulthood, uh, best I can tell is over. Here we go, guys. Let me grab you some more iced tea here. Anything else I can get for you right away? Okay, enjoy. Since Black Friday, I started working at Rounders, which is like a bar and grill um, restaurant. Been working there for a couple months now. Can I get you something to drink? I will have water. What would you like? Do you want? Full Tilt Poker hasn't released any money to U.S. players, and unfortunately, I had about 95% of my funds in full tilt. I don't know that I have it in me to start from ground zero again. I just, it's just such a grind and it's so hard and I just don't know that I have it in me to do that anymore. Do you guys need a little bit? Or For so long, a lot of our life plans okay, and goals were wrapped up in that and it's really hard to just, in the blink of an eye, change everything and alter your path. Now that it's settled in a little bit since Black Friday, I think the, the biggest thing that that hurts is just the, you know, the dream is kind of gone and the, the, the progress of what she was, you know, working towards and, and really, really good at. It's not that it's not that she failed at it, somebody just took it away and said, It's done. That's hard for me, you know, as the husband to sit there and I I don't have an answer, you know, I can't there's nothing I can do to to make it better. So that's, that, that's probably what hurts the most. All right, three, two, one. Welcome to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast for the week of July 31st, 2012. Mike Johnson here, along with Adam Schwartz. It is a great day for online poker players. It is, Mike. Who says there's no fairy tale endings in real life? Uh, yeah, dust off the champagne bottles. Here's the story. A $700 million deal has been struck with the DOJ that will settle all civil charges between online poker giants, poker stars, and full tilt poker. And are you ready for this? The twist in this, poker stars will acquire the the assets of their former rival Full Tilt Poker from the DOJ with the plan to relaunch the disgraced Full Tilt Poker Room uh, later this year. This is massive. It really is. The best news of all is that the players who have had money stuck online, stuck at Full Tilt Poker since April of 2011, they're going to get that back. 300 million Three, bucks. Over 300 million dollars. The deal was well received in season nine. They brought me back for season 10. Now we're at the point of negotiating for the future. I'm surprised, but I actually like having a job. And you know, it doesn't require me to do anything that's unnatural. For the most part, I show up and I meet people and I talk about poker and I wear a suit and smile and it's not you know, terribly hard. So what's not to like? At the moment I'm playing in a band called Alexi Martov. It's kind of like a blues, psychedelic rock three-piece that I like sing, play guitar, play piano in. I mean, in the future with poker, I definitely plan to keep playing. I mean, I love the game. It's really given me the opportunity to kind of like sit down, decide what I want, and then formulate a, a plan to achieve that. It's just at this point, I, th I think that music is going to be the major priority that I work on. Since Black Friday, I've been traveling back and forth um, to LA. I go to the Commerce Casino to play live poker. 
usually I'm home for like six weeks and then I go out there for about seven to ten days and then I come home and do the same thing, so. All right, I'll be home soon, but okay? Okay, mom. Okay, I love you. Love One you. more hug. I really realized how much poker means to me and how much I do love playing poker. And I now know that playing poker for a living is something that I definitely want to continue doing for as long as I can. And I guess if that means I have to continue flying across the country to play live poker, that's what I'll do. Bye, buddy. I think online poker is in a short-term dark period here in America, but at the end of the day, the economics are just too obvious. Nobody's gonna sit back and let these sites in Europe or in other parts of the world make billions of dollars a year when they know that it would be equally as popular here in America. Will online poker eventually become legalized? Will it be regulated? Will this create an impetus to change and to quit ignoring this act, this this action as, as though it doesn't exist? It does exist, it will always exist. Gambling and poker playing will always be part of society and our culture. Poker has a future. Online poker has a future. Does it have anything to do uh, with what came before? Probably not. It's gonna look different, and it always does. 20 years ago, nobody ever would have thought you'd have people playing poker online, period. So I think it's gonna be very surprising the way it develops. I mean, the game's gonna be big, the game's going to grow, but what it looks like, who's playing it, who's winning, who's losing, all that's a mystery, which is what poker is. It's a mystery. You pick up your cards, you bet your chips, and you don't really know what's gonna happen until the final card is dealt. The final card hasn't been dealt. In fact, we haven't even seen the flop yet. UltimatePoker.com is pleased to announce that the wait is over. We are now live and dealing online poker in the state of Nevada. Ultimate Poker is proud of this historic moment as the first trusted and legal online poker company to have real money poker in the United States.